Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the work of Avenidas, which provides support to our elders in the San Francisco Bay Area with special guest, Amy Yotopoulos, President and CEO of Avenidas. And Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm delighted to be here today. So in 1963, 1963, May was established as the month to celebrate our elders as Older Americans Month. And at that time, only 17 million living Americans had reached their 65th birthday. And today it's 56 million. And by 2030, there will be over 73 million Americans who have reached that age. Now, we've seen a lot of change, particularly in the in the 30s and 40s, where you started to have Social Security, which basically alleviated uh, so much uh, poverty in the United States, which reside both at the younger end, uh, children, and at the at the older end, our elders. Uh, but you you're going to have a move from roughly 17 percent of Americans being older Americans uh, over 65 to over 20 percent in a very short period of time, and the the population is aging. So let's talk a little bit about, from your perspective, how you see us meeting the challenge through a mixture of government programs, but also through private nonprofit organizations like yours. What kind of services do you provide and how do you see the landscape developing over the next years? Yeah, and this is a big question that comes up in the press a lot. And I just want to put it out there that a lot of us don't like some of those phrases like the gray tsunami or the silver tsunami, because I think there's an implication that because you're old, you're automatically um, unable and needy. And the vast majority of older adults in our country, even though they may have three chronic conditions like heart disease or um, high blood pressure, or diabetes, or some of those things are still very active and healthy. And so this is where Laura Karstensen, who, um, is a Stanford professor and founder of the Stanford Center on Longevity and wrote a beautiful book called A Long Bright Future, where she talks about, you know, the older adults in the world, including the US, are the only natural resource that is growing. We forget that they have so much to give. And so that's something I, I want to talk about along with our programs as well, because you have to have both. And I think most importantly to, to remember too, when we're planning for things like this is old age happens, starts happening <laughs> in a young age. And so we just have not prepared. And the more we can do earlier to prepare, it's kind of like, oh, I'm not gonna run a marathon tomorrow. I need to think about things way before the actual race happens. So before you hit 65 or 70 or whatever you think that magic old age number is, there's a lot of work and planning that needs to be done. And some of that stuff is work that we're doing here at Avenidas. Well, you're also talking about a psychological shift, right? Mm -hmm. So there, was a, a, there is a psychology that, that gets embedded uh, within us at an early age where we're defining ourselves as having hit a milestone and then we suddenly become old. But really what, is, what, what has happened is that our health has evolved considerably, our knowledge of what makes us healthy. When my uh, grandfather had a heart attack and he passed away at 50, Right. His first heart attack was at 48. They told him that he couldn't exercise. The absolute wrong thing to do. And it, it worsened his conditions and uh, conditioned until uh, he passed away. Nowadays, if you have a heart attack, the first thing they try to do is to get you to exercise because the heart is a muscle. You want to exercise the muscle. And you actually see this kind of change in perspective so that the you know, people who previously were were 50, 60, their average health, actually now that's migrated to 60, 70, 80. Um, and, and we can live a healthier life. So let's talk a little bit about that prep. How do you ensure that people, once they get older, have had the prep, have had the life habits that reduces incidence of of the requirement of insulin, like diabetes, and reduces heart disease, reduces so that so that we're living a healthier life, so that when we when we get older, we can actually enjoy our lives more. Yes, and Laura Carsonson also will say it's a three-legged stool, right? So to 
there's a quote in her book, um, something along the lines of, in order for individuals and society to thrive, you need three things of this stool, the financial component, the health, physical health and mobility component, and finally the, the mental or mind component. And so the financial piece really is understanding you are going to need to work a lot longer than you think you will. You can't fund John Chauvin at Stanford is popularized for saying you can't fund a 30 year retirement with a 40 year career. But the issue is our policies haven't quite arranged for older adults to continue working well into their 70s if they want to or can. So That's there's a, a very good point. Uh, yeah. let, before we move on, let's let, let's go. You cannot fund a 30 year retirement with a 40 year career. That is really important. So mm -hmm. we're in this, this career thing, you know, unless we're independently wealthy and we're, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that way. But we're in this career thing for the long haul, aren't we? We are. And I think luckily this is one of the silver linings of COVID. We're realizing that there are different ways of working and that people want that work-life balance. I think there's a lot of stereotypes about older workers and they've all been since disproven, you know, that they're expensive, they're unhealthy, they don't know technology. You know, there's a long list of reasons that people put out there why they don't want to hire older workers. And the reality is they have so much emotional intelligence. They have a lot of life experience. There's a huge need for mentorship in our society today. There's a lot of roles that could be filled. And so I think there's a lot of roles that, um, I think the jobs that I'm gonna have in my seventies may not even exist today. <laughs> and so there's a lot of progress that needs to be made and policies that need to be changed for that as well. And attitudes, you know, I remember I, I was a teamster uh, working in a warehouse, I was a young guy. And there were uh, people who were way older than, than I was who were no longer physically capable of doing the heavy lifting stuff. But I will absolutely stand by those people as being great mentors. They, they taught me the craft of, of moving goods within a warehouse. They organized the work. They took their experience and they used it, used it a different way, even though they're, they were physically unable to necessarily do the warehouse work that, that the younger um, mm -hmm. people were able to do. Um, that kind of expertise, and you see that in finance knowledge or even people management skills, uh, things like uh, delayed gratification, which uh, which younger younger people are pretty terrible at, mm -hmm. but older people have the experience uh, very often to, to do. I mean, I don't want to be into cliches here, but there are certain average skills that you acquire with age that you don't necessarily have in your younger years. Absolutely. And there, there is an urban legend, and I say that only because I haven't found the actual data of a, um, a car manufacturing plant, and they wanted to find out, you know, how what workers make the best cars. And so they had just really young workers on the assembly line, and they made the most cars. They put only older workers on the assembly line, and they didn't make a lot of cars, but um, they, there were no mistakes, whereas the younger ones made a lot of mistakes. And of course, the best one is the one where you have both. You get the most cars with the, the fewer errors in them. And so I think that can be, like you said, um, thought about in other arenas and, and areas of work, too, that we need all, all, five, <laughs> all five generations under each workplace. So how do you enact that in how you shape your staff over at Avenidas? I mean, it's it's always great to talk about somebody else, but mm -hmm. now, you're, now if, if you're talking about yourself, do you also have a staff that is made up of people of different ages? And different we do. Ages? We've got our Gen Zers all the way up to the silent generation. So we're really proud of that. We're a small organization. We have less than 50 people here, but it's one of those things where um, it just makes for a better, happier workforce. And they've shown that too, that people are not just more productive, but they're more likely to stay and there's less attrition and more retention. So it just, I think like any other ism, um, anytime you have that diversity of workplace and it feels inclusive of all ages and everybody, it just makes a better place to work. How does that actually affect the culture, right? You have people who are in their career building stage. And I know when I was in my career building stage, I was kind of impatient. Mm -hmm. And if, if there was somebody who was occupying a job that I wanted and I didn't think that they were moving fast enough, I would behave in a way that perhaps is not um, today. I wouldn't I wouldn't behave in that way. Right. Um, and and how do you how do you create that balance? How do you create a culture 
that is cooperative, that also respects the needs of people at different ages, their aspirations and so on, keeping a stable environment, but also giving people opportunity? How do you how do you deal with it? I that's a great question. I really look to Mark Friedman at what was formerly Encore.org, and now the organization is called CoGenerate. And they he is living that right now. So he was the founder and CEO of Encore.org. And now he has a co-CEO who's of a different generation and different gender, much younger than him. And they have, for me, kind of laid out what that looks like. And his his quote is, you know, make sure you're not, what is it? I think it's moving people over, not out. <laughs> so to allow for the younger people to take on more responsibility under the mentorship of people who perhaps have had that same role before. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, most older workers may not want to work full time and they may want to do certain parts of their job that they really loved and not the parts that they don't. And so there's a way to, to work together to bring up the next generation of whatever leaders or workers and at the same time make sure that there's still that that living library and legacy that people have the information they have the support because i think particularly now i've been reading about how younger workers during remote work have really lacked supervision and i use that term <laughs> loosely not having someone over them telling them what to do but really giving them support from underneath and making sure that they feel like they have the resources they need to grow in their role. So I think, I hope that's what we strive to do here as well. Um, when people start expressing a need to reduce um, some of their responsibilities or hours, we, we try to make that happen here so that people can, like I said, move over, but not out. Is there a cultural aspect here that, that connects to, to values that you try to promulgate that, that creates the setting? For this to happen, one of the things that that in my career, I've I've worked in the banking industry, I've worked on Wall Street, I've worked on, I've worked in tech, I've worked in a lot of different manufacturing, I've worked in a lot of different environments, and not to mention worked in a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. And in order to create this kind of an environment, you have to have a set of core principles. If your core principles is is to make as much money and, and close the deal as quickly as possible, you're going to get certain behaviors. If your core principle is to take care of people, you might get other behaviors. What kind of, of, of values do you promulgate at Avenidas that are functional to your mission of reinventing aging? It's a great question. You know, I think I'm trying to remember our list of values, but I do think a huge piece of that is the respect. And whether we're helping take care of someone or giving them resources or supporting one another, it's an anti-ageist value, which is all people of all ages deserve the respect and, and um, acknowledgement that they allow us to have space in the world. And so when we're designing programs or services, when we're thinking about making changes to our workplace, when we partner with other organizations, it really is around how can we do this um, in, in the most respectful way, but also in the most way that will make sure that people's needs are met in the community. Does that stymie you from making crisp managerial decisions? For example, if you find somebody who just needs to move on, it isn't that they're not right for your organization. Are you stymied out of, out of a sense of respect? No, I think there's still a very respectful way to do that, obviously. I think in any workplace, there may be mismatches, right? And it doesn't mean that they're not a great worker. It just means they would be a better worker someplace else um, if there was a better fit. And so absolutely, it's it's. Um, I don't want to make it sound like a utopia <laughs> that 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 we have, you know, all all good workers all the time. But I, I do want to support people so that they find the right fit for them. So um, could you talk a little bit about the various programs that you have and how you look at, at the work at Avenidas of reinventing aging and, and what kind of, of different services and different uh, approaches uh, that you provide your members? Absolutely. Yeah. When, when we were started in the 60s, it was kind of um, a new thing. Most cities kind of run their own senior centers. And so when um, a group of older adults came together and realized the needs that we have in our community in the 60s and realized it would be better suited if we had our own nonprofit, they started it. 
And again, you know, back to that three legged stool needing the financial, physical and mental piece. It's a lot of how our programs are organized. And so the financial piece, we have financial conferences and housing conferences to help people understand, you know, what they need to be doing pre and post retirement. There's a lot of work that we do for tax support, um, counseling to help select health um, plans. I think that's a big one that even I <laughs> struggle with. The, annual Medicare enrollment is really difficult. We have some right. emergency funds for people, that kind of stuff. A um, lot of work with- provide culturally government. appropriate services to different members of, of community based on their et ethnicity and, and, and the environments in which they grew up. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'll target maybe two that are our most recent additions. One is our Chinese Community Center. So we're very needs-based. We do a lot of needs assessment. And it was clear that particularly in our area in South Palo Alto, the growing Chinese population, mainly immigrant Chinese, a lot of them non-English speaking. So we have a South Palo Alto location now that serves that population and anyone else who wants to join. Uh, I call it trilingual because they do Mandarin, English and Cantonese. And the programs are, you know, some of them are exercise classes, some of them are, you know, cultural, some of them are more art. They, they do a lot online and now they're back in person. And it's just a beautiful way for people to come together and, and speak the language <laughs> that they know, but also, learn Cantonese, learn English. There's karaoke, mahjong, ping pong, a lot of fun activities, a lot of cultural activities, and it's very intergenerational, which is the piece that I love as well. So that's one of them. Um, our Rainbow Collective, we were really fortunate that our county supervisor here in Santa Clara County, Joe Simidian, um, helped spearhead this after a survey of LGBTQ seniors in our area. And they have very unique needs after a lifetime of being discriminated against. Um, they often are more low income because they haven't been able to get jobs. They have history of abuse or mistreatment in the healthcare system. And so there's not a lot of trust there and they may have special health issues. They weren't allowed to marry or have children or adopt children. So oftentimes the family support for a variety of reasons, whether it's from parents or siblings or even having a spouse or child is missing. And so they have these unique needs that our Rainbow Collective was formed for, and we're really delighted that it's growing in, in our county as well. So those are the two of the programs I would highlight that are more around the, the changing cultural needs of our community. Well, you're also highlighting two, two communities that where there, is, there are real hidden problems. So for example, if you look at uh, Asia, uh, uh, aging Chinese communities, particularly the older relatives, uh, there is a huge unseen issue of, of uh, women, aging women, um, who only speak Chinese, who become isolated and, um, and have a tendency toward depression and, and even suicide, right? You have in the LGBTQ uh, plus community, you have a history of family rejection um, mm -hmm. as people come out and so many people are affected by that. So that network, even without children, that network of family support might not be there. And, and as you said, you know, there, there are so many other uh, issues of, of income and, and other uh, issues. How do you create the connection between amongst uh, people of the same generation, but also intergenerational connections that might be, uh, that might allow for young people to benefit from the mentorship that older people can give, but might not normally be transferable because of barriers of language or barriers of age or whatever. How do you create an environment that allows that allows younger people to benefit from these interactions? That's one of my favorite things to talk about. I think um, I'll give an example with the Rainbow Collective. Our, our um, program manager there, Thomas Kingery, started something which was a letter writing campaign. And it was basically between younger LGBTQ folks and the older folks. And it was just such a beautiful way to almost like have a pen pal. I think this was during COVID. And so they weren't necessarily supposed to be you know, in person. There were some concerns around that. And it just grew like wildfire. I think there was such a need for younger people today, even though I think there's more cultural acceptance of them. 
sometimes there isn't and they still would love to talk to someone who's kind of been there done that and they can see what the road ahead looks like um and same for the older adult i think there's they've been through so much and paved that way for this generation and so having even the the beauty of writing letters is has been really helpful same with the accc they don't do the letter writing but i think where we see a lot of people really wanting to do more is around language acquisition and so a lot of the younger people who may ironically speak English at home because their parents want to speak English. They're trying to teach them Chinese after school. So there's these after school Chinese programs. And there's a lot of opportunities since we're all in the same area in this community center for the older adults and the younger kids to interact. And especially during the holidays, whether it's, um, you know, Chinese New Year or some of these things, it's really fun to see all the kids and adults together. Now, I noticed that you do do a lot of education programs. You do a lot of uh, social programs. You also provide um, quite a few discrete services, direct services uh, to people to help support them. Could you uh, go through a list of the types of services that you provide directly beyond education and the softer services of, of forging connections? Yeah, so some of the um, direct health care, uh, a lot of it is at our Rose Kleiner Center. So this is a health care center. If you know what an adult day health care center is, it's kind of like a child care center. Nobody lives there at night, but our vans go and pick you up where you live and bring you there for the day. And you can have all kinds of health services. We have RNs there, OTPT, speech therapy, a dietitian, prepared meals, a physician oversees your care plan. It really is for very frail elderly to um, who are nursing home eligible to get that kind of care out of the home so that the family caregiver can go to work or, or take care of themselves. And that's a big piece of what we do. Here in our North Palo Alto location, we do things like hearing checks, there's um, foot care and nail care. There's, we used to have massage, we're trying to get a massage therapist back in. There's some direct you know, physical care that we can give people here to keep track of their um, uh, physical wellness as well. Um, the most important, I think, that we do here often is our care partners. So this is our social workers who help both family members as well as the older adults with life transitions. So it's a lot of information around what happens after a hospitalization or let's do some long term care planning. It's a big one when families decide to, you know, sell the family home and try to downsize. A lot of questions there for our case management and our social work team as well. Um, trying to think of other direct services. What kind of partners, partnerships do you forge so that other people who are doing other types of direct services um, have access to your clients and, and that sort of communication amongst your clients and, and these partner organizations are facilitated? That's a big one for our Rose Kleiner Center. So we partner with county health plans, both in San Mateo and Santa Clara County. We partner with the VA for our veterans. Obviously, um, Medicaid is a big one, Medi-Cal here. We also partner with AARP. They were the ones who came in and helped us do tax work. There's HICAP, which is the um, health insurance counseling program here locally and in the country. SALA does legal advice. There's a lot of organizations that we bring into our building um, to help us do these types of things. Pacific Hearing helps us do our hearing checks. There's a lot of um, other groups and companies that have been very helpful to us. Now, in the future, the need is not going to diminish. It's going to only increase. That's how we started. Yeah. Um, how do you see the organization developing over the next several years? It's a great question. We just completed a strategic plan, and before we did all that, did a massive um, survey from Polco called the Community Assessment of Seniors. I think that's right. Yeah, CASOA survey. And it allows us to benchmark with national data. And so we're keeping a really good track of what is changing in our community. And it's not just the demographics, but that the needs are changing as well. And so if we're looking, you know, right now or even three years ahead with the economy, three of the things that popped up um, are around cost of living here in Silicon Valley lack of available affordable housing and not understanding what else is available in housing. And so we can see very clearly right now that 
where to live, how to live there, how to afford it, how to get the support and services you need where you decide or can live is going to be a huge, huge need coming forward. So it's that's an area that we're starting to see a lot of growth in here at Avenidas as well. Are you providing new services in response to this or planning to provide new services? Exactly. Yeah. So we're bringing back our housing conference. We haven't done that since COVID. We're bringing back our handyman services. That's a huge one. And we've started talking with other organizations in the area to do more partnerships, including the city of Palo Alto. We're doing a um, housing resource fair in a couple of weeks. And it's not just resources. It's a housing action resource fair where people can actually sign up to get on lists and to understand what's available. I think the hugest problem right now is we can get everybody on the lists, uh, but the lists are years long. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm looking at is there there's some things for, let's put it this way, that the very, very low income, they'll be taken care of between Medi-Cal and, and some of the services, there's, there's something for them. Obviously, the people who have a lot of money, they're going to be taken care of. But there's this forgotten middle, and this is what the NORC at the University of Chicago has done a lot of research on, which is this forgotten middle of people who won't get the support that they need from federal or state or local level, and they don't have the resources. And it's about 40% of us who are going to struggle with this idea of living and also caring for each other whether it's our parents our spouses our children whatever that looks like and it's it's a huge thing that we need to be looking at um, along with our partners and potential new partners to help affect change there well i think what you're doing is so very important you're helping people who as they get older uh might if they're not careful slip into that that category of people who are in financial distress so you're trying to uh, transfer information um, as quickly as possible so that people can prepare. And then once they they have those various needs, once they're at that point, you're providing a whole range of services uh, to keep uh, communication vital and then to create cross-generational uh, connection, which is so important. You are creating community that gets dissolved in our urban and modern environment you're rebuilding it as, as it's dissolving. You're building it faster than it's dissolving. And it's it, it's such a laudable uh, act on your part. Uh, Amy Yotopoulos, thank you so much for sharing the work of, of Avenidas with us. Please thank your people who are so very important as part of this community, your clients who are also part of, of this sort of self-service community, and your board members, your funders. It's just a wonderful, wonderful model for us all to follow. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes, our, our staff is by far the best every, anywhere. So we're very grateful to all of them. And this has been wonderful to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.